He took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. By some, he's been called controversial. I'll keep my freedom. I'll keep my guns. Try to keep my money and my religion too. Now, now, keep in mind that some of my guests have been approached by oh, Homeland Security or FBI saying, Oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Douglas show? My message to those guys that they're listening this morning is go get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll learn something. We both took the same oath, you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. I'm going to keep my big V8. Keep my friends the same. Keep the government out of my business and y'all can keep the change. He is the free American, Clay Douglas. We know what we need. We know who to blame. Catch the Free American Hour weekdays at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. For the podcast and more details, visit www.freeamerican.com or catch the podcast by phone by calling 832-999-8621. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Free American Hour. I'm your host, Clay Douglas. My guest today is Nancy Fulton. She is the founder of the Film Funding Club, and her website is filmfundingclub.com. Hello, Nancy. How are you? Fine. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. So, okay. so you 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 went to my site and and you were a little worried because you're a progressive. Now now I'm I, I I'm really uh, I'm really interested to hear about your take on this, because I used to be fairly comfortable uh, mm -hmm. under under Bill Clinton being called a right wing extremist. But when the real right wing extremist got into office in the form of George Bush, I guess I became a a liberal then. So I'm not yes, quite sure. Actually, I had that same experience. <laughs> 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 It's funny because I looked at your website and I'm like, you know, the thing is that, you know, I came, um, I used to be a libertarian. Okay, so I, I am fond, as it turns out, of the Constitution. <laughs> it makes me, I don't know, some sort of radical now. Well, but I'm fond of the Constitution. You know, so the, the I, you know, and then, but apparently that made me a progressive. I don't know. Like I thought, <laughs> that whole thing about maybe you should be, like you were innocent until proven guilty. We should, like, maybe not pepper spray people until they're guilty of something and maybe we've arrested them. Well, and maybe, maybe we could have a trial once in a while. You know, that kind of shit. <laughs> Pardon the expression. But I mean, it's actually, that is actually, uh, you know, so, yeah, and then um, I, and I don't really kind of like the whole party thing either way at the moment. I can't really see all that much difference between the two parties. I, I refer to it, I refer to it as the the tactics are called divide and conquer, mm -hmm. and uh, the the method is well the Republican Democrat though that's two wings of the same bird and that bird is a global vulture you know we we, we just have to have the the global union we have to have uh, this this is a globalization we 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 just need one bank to issue all the money for everybody in the world and so everybody in the world can pay us taxes uh, you know basically I don't know exactly. Does that make me an extremist because I recognize the banks for what they are? I don't. I mean, for me, I think the, um, I think the, we live in a world where there's not. There used to be things called nation states, and there was a difference between countries. And I think it's still the case. I mean, I certainly don't want to be living in, you know, <laughs> many parts of the Middle East. It's like Egypt is not looking all that friendly these days. Or, you know, there's some very scary places, many places in Africa I don't want to live, so there's definitely an advantage to being here in the United States. But what I do think is that there are corporations that spread from nation to nation. And a friend of mine actually says that, um, he says really the corporations pretty much shop for the best deal. And if they don't like how things are going, they just go on to the next place. They just move their operations or they shift their oper the operations so that they're always basically 
doing business in the place that's best for them, which probably makes sense, except for the fact that they're so big, you know. And, and the other thing is that they have the ability to to eliminate competition. So you end up with a more and more uniform, and not necessarily more and more benevolent um, group of people running things. And one of the things I found particularly shocking recently is the um, robo signing thing, because usually when you have a mortgage, we made all these rules about when you have a mortgage, you have to record it. Well, when they started selling those mortgages off as investments, they decided that they couldn't really go around recording who owned them. So then they, when they so they created this thing called MERS, and then when they had to suit to foreclose on people, MERS doesn't own the mortgages. The stockholders own them. That So they just started robo-signing people's foreclosure papers. And I'm like, how is that the least bit legal? And I don't understand why... That <laughs> I don't understand why that's actually allowed to continue. It's like there's no, are there no laws? Have we just done away with the law thing? Because I thought there were laws about that. Yeah. But apparently, there's not. Pretty much, and and you know the courts are getting away with whatever they can get away from with. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and the the courts are working for the banks. The banks are are, are pulling all the strings behind this. And no, uh, the corporations. I think the court. The thing that's amazing is the relationship between corporations and banks, right? The banks <laughs> for turning their mortgages into investment vehicles, and they were, and those investment vehicles were bought up by everybody's four hundred one k. I mean, it, the amazing thing is how many, how much money is taken away from people to put into stuff that's supposed to be investments for their retirement or whatever. And then, in this last episode, those those um, investments went away because they were put into this scheme based upon the future value of mortgages. So it's, it's really a very twisted thing. <laughs> it, it, it is a very twisted, way too twisted to get into today, but mm -hmm. the uh, yeah, we I, I was just uh, going over reading uh, uh, the stories of the day, and, and families uh, like in Las Vegas, Mm -hmm. They're way behind on their on their mortgages. Their their houses are valued at a hundred thousand, and they owe a hundred and sixty thousand on them. Right. And well, the ones that are but, worse than that, yeah. But let's get uh, let's get back to what you do now. I'm 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 very interested in this. I'm a writer. I started yep. my first uh, book forty years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually started it. Uh, about a science fiction book about the United States uh, sometime in the future when mm -hmm. marijuana was legal, when uh, all victimless crimes had been abolished, when the uh, country was pretty much run for the people again. And mm -hmm. uh, I wrote that in prison doing time for having marijuana in Texas back when it was a life sentence. Yeah, to yeah. Today mm -hmm. it's 17 countries, or 17 uh, states you can smoke pot without going to jail. If you signed up for your doctor and you're paying your doctors off, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, my 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 book was a little too radical back then, mm -hmm. and uh, today it don't seem quite so radical anymore. And I and I I've, I've actually turned that into a, I've got kind of a screenplay up on. The Lucifer Legacy, or the Lucifer Legends, which is the working title for a screenplay I did for uh, uh, HBO. I, I did it for an attorney for HBO, but the attorney wanted 15% uh, as my manager, 10% as my attorney, and 10% as my agent, and I turned down the uh, deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what it was, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, basically, um, I'm an independent, kind of similar to you, I'm an independent writer, um, producer, and um, in addition to that, uh, um, in the past I've also been, uh, I've taught people how to use computers, so I have a really strong background in um, education as well as in uh, publishing and in uh, creating video content. So I think they all sort of came together in the Film Funding Club. One of the things that I feel passionately about with the Film Funding Club is that um, the technology exists right now for people to be able to create media which goes worldwide, and it's also possible to market it. There are, I mean, it is an undisputed truth that there are about six corporations inside the United States that, can, that um, control um, the, most of the production and distribution resources that have been, the big ones that have been used to date. Now, in a way, that makes sense because the mass media benefits 
from consolidation? Does the cost go down? So if you're a corporation and you own one radio station, you might as well own two. And if you own one TV studio, you might as well own two. And um, also, when you're promoting media, it certainly does help to have multiple methodologies that you can pr promote through, whether it's newspapers or um, through television stations or through um, screen time in theaters. So it makes sense that it would consolidate. But the problem is that you do kind of get a uniformity of vision. And the other thing is that you end up with content which is created as a product. Now, I, one of the examples I like to use is um, uh, the Disney Channel. No, no child on earth lives like those kids. No child on earth has ever lived like those children. It's a, it's a, and it's created to look like it. They make these films because it makes sense for them to make it. But, and because people want it. But you're not seeing sort of Opie Taylor on the Andy Griffin show, which was kind of a more real show. You're even a Brady Bunch, which was still kind of twisted, but at least, you know, that whole, it just turned into this giant product. Well, I think that there's a huge hunger inside the United States from stories that are told more from the place that we actually live. You know? I mean, we actually live in a different world, and I think... I personally like to see films and documentaries about the, the world that we actually live in and not this thing that's created well, to sell copies. Well, you know, I've referred to uh, television mm -hmm. as uh, they don't call it programming for nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the we, uh, we talk about this a lot on the show, and this is uh, one of the reasons I was really uh, looking forward to having you on my show, because you... Uh, you say uh, that Hollywood and New York don't control news and entertainment anymore. We do. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Internet is like a double-edged sword, isn't it? I mean, they can use it to monitor us. They can use it to uh, see how much we're paying for this and that, and where our money's going and where our money's being kept. But we are able to communicate with each other and put out ideas that may be contrary to the mainstream the banker controlled, you know, and, and Thomas Thomas Jefferson actually warned us before the, uh, as he was, uh, they were working on the Constitution, while they were signing the uh, Declaration of Independence, he wanted, warned us, if you ever allow a private bank to issue your money, the banks and the corporations that spring up around them will leave your children homeless in the land that we conquered. Right, well, I definitely think that, I definitely think that it is true that the internet does make it everything that you do on the internet is tracked and it's trackable now, the other, but the thing is that there's only so much that anybody's interested in stopping and there's only so much that is um, possible to stop as we've seen across the Middle East the use of the internet even in completely unexpected ways sort of not using it in an off-label way. In other words, you know, people aren't supposed to be really raising a revolution with Twitter. It just kind of worked out. And so the thing is that um, it, it allows us to unite. It allows people to unite. It also allows people to have dialogue about things that they agree and they don't agree about, which I think makes, um, makes for a more, uh, can make, and often, often does, I think, make for a more truthful world. In other words, the dialogue critical and the dialogue is important and I think that's one of the things that's really been shut down by over the course of the last you know 50 years or so it is not it's just not the case that you have editor you know editorials like he used to have between the New York Times and the Washington Post he's like you don't used to have these don't all, that kind of dialogue has gone away and um, I felt passionately about creating the film funding club because if I see a documentary one of the things that's amazing, like we had this whole Gulf oil spill, remember? Now, I have no idea what's going on in the Gulf now, because it's no longer the mainstream news. I suspect there might be something. I would never know by watching the mainstream media that anything bad has happened. You know, like, it, like so what's up with the fish thing? Like, there's a couple news stories, but hardly any. So I like the idea that if there's somebody that's actually in the Gulf of, um, in, in around the Gulf, they could actually create a video and they could tell me, yeah, you know, the fish look like this now, and it's because we went out here and did you know or this is what's happening to the wildlife around, so we figure it's probably pretty bad for the fish that are in the water, maybe you shouldn't eat it. Or people that are looking into fracking, and they're saying, you know, maybe this isn't such a fine thing to pump all this stuff into the water. People can tell those stories. And I'm even hoping, actually, quite frankly, worldwide, that people can actually pick up 
you know, to play some role in helping people worldwide pick up their cameras and pick up their cell phones and start creating content that people could see. Like, I don't really know what's going on in, Fu in Fukushima. There were, they had, there's six reactors at that plant, three of them melted down. The fourth one's got 1,500 rods hanging in the air that's in a pool that's going to break, and which will catch fire if it loses water. And it's like, so I wouldn't mind actually having some independent media from over there. So I guess my feeling is that I don't know, I'm passionate about making it so that people have the ability to tell the stories that are most important. Well, you know, let me. What what put me into this? What st I started my magazine, which was called the Free American, mm -hmm. back in 1994. I also started the militias at the time. And you remember the the mainstream media was really going after us, trying to blame the militias for Oklahoma City, trying to trying to demonize us. I was listed in the ADLs, armed and dangerous. And uh, when I uh, helped somebody run for president in '96, I was listed in false patriots put out by Southern Poverty Law. And uh, these are all Jewish-owned organizations that uh, really capitalize off of creating enemies where they are none. And that's happening right now because the media is not covering this. The Tea Parties are being trying, or they're trying to portray Tea Party people as, you know, fat, white, racist. They're trying to, de uh, to, to portray the Occupy folks who are, who are marching against the corporations that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to demonize uh, them, and and they they want to put us at odds with the police, getting us fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, right. now the, the the reason I started the Free American was mm -hmm. because I was so outraged at the way the press covered Waco. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. well the government had to go in there and kill those seventeen little children to save them from from a, a, a child molester who was never convicted, never charged, mm -hmm. never uh, never. Uh, no proof uh, ever offered that he was anything uh, like a, a, a child molester. And they killed almost a hundred people. I, and the press, uh, well, they had to do that. I don't think so. And I started the magazine, the Free American Magazine, which was on the newsstands in Barnes and Noble and Books a Million all around the country for ten years. Mm. Well, I think that... <laughs> Did I mention many of my best friends are Jews? But so, but I think the I think one thing you're saying that actually is accurate is that um, uh, there is a corporatization of media which makes it so you pick the story that you're going to run with, and that is the story that you run with. And the thing is that it's set almost in the earliest stages of any kind of um, news coverage on a big event. They kind of split up what the dialogue is going to be about. It will be the most palatable conversation that you can possibly have, and one that shakes, you know, uh, established, this doesn't ask awkward questions. Like in Waco's case, if you kind of go, well, that guy ran every single day, why don't you just pick him up when he was running? If you really did not like that particular guy, like, what you did was probably the worst possible thing you possibly could have done. And then, you know, I think the coverage after 9-11 was pretty interesting, because it really seemed like, it, you know, when you look back at the coverage of 9-11, some of them, it's just kind of crazy, like, I remember watching in real time as they said that they, you know, basically it sounded to me like they said they were going to bring down Building 7. And yet later it was basically attributed to the terrorists bringing it down. And, and I, and yet if you go back to the footage, it does seem like it. So it's a very strange thing because what happens at the very beginning of the story is the mainstream media, and maybe they're just doing their jobs, they're trying to find a story, they don't want to go against the, once it gets established, they don't want to go against it. But in retrospect, you look back and you go, that was crazy. <laughs> what was that about? And that doesn't make any sense at all. It, it may have been. Uh, Waco, I mean, I'm sorry, Waco was a psychological operation against the American people. See, mm -hmm. don't resist us by force of arms. See what happened? See what mm -hmm. they made us do by resisting us with uh, uh, with arms? But 9-11... They made that that was so fake. I said George Bush. Uh, they accused me of being a conspiracy theorist, but George Bush makes me look sick. He wants you to believe that a bunch of Arabs in a cave in Afghanistan made the U.S. Air Force stand down and brought those buildings down. Actually, my favorite is actually I was a conspiracy theorist because I thought there was no um, there were no weapons of mass destruction in um, Iraq early. Like I was one of the first people going, 
but we just had a report that said there was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So now you're tell so wait. <laughs> but now you're telling me that there was. So I, I, apparently I joined also the conspiracy theorist ranks at that at that juncture. <laughs> <laughs> much to my surprise. And I'm like, it's interesting because the CIA put out the report that said there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But remember when they went on and on and on and on and on and on about how, you know, Saddam Hussein was working with, uh, you know, and how he helped, helped mastermind the 9-11 attacks. And you're like, really? Because he's really not such the, he was actually pretty secular. <laughs> he was a pretty secular guy, actually. He was the one that let people, girls run around with like, you know, wearing normal clothes. They didn't have to wear the hajib or anything. So, it I don't know, that the news, again, it comes back to the fact that the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm passionate about helping people create media is that I think when push comes to shove, the truth tends to be more interesting and to sell better. So, <laughs> I, I don't think that they've I, been able to go... I don't know. I don't know. here. I might have to disagree with that. I have a book out called Mystery Babylon mm -hmm. that is non-fiction. Mm -hmm. It's about my whole battle with the CIA since I blew the whistle on their drug smuggling operation called Operation Watchtower about 25 years ago. Hmm. That was George Bush's uh, little operation. All of that's in my book. But I have a fiction series uh, called Trevor Cameron, which is basically uh, done along the lines in the same style as John D. McDonald's Travis McGee series. Mm-hmm. Boat bum in, in Florida and Bahia Mar. Well, my character is the son of the character he created, sort of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and no, no, no trademark differences. I mean, I because I communicated with the lawyers for John D. McDonald's son for years over this, and I have I have that series. Uh, One bloody alabaster eye, deadly flashes of silver, and they're pure fiction, pure fiction, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they're more believable than my nonfiction. Yeah, actually, I gotta say the truth is the truth is far stranger than fiction. Like you know, I, I, the girls being a perfect example. It's like so we're just gonna let. Okay, so why is there still a British Petroleum? I would think if you had poisoned an entire Gulf, that you would your company would at least go out of business. But apparently that's not so, and yeah. I don't understand why it's not so. It seems like they should be held. Their assets would be seized, and we would use it to clean up stuff. They Not were they happen. were being they were used to go after our food supply in the Gulf. That that whole thing was engineered. The uh, they developed the airborne laser right across the street from me. I, I went up there to visit their facility at White Sands Missile Range, and they bragged. They bragged because they all knew me. They all knew me. They stopped by to buy magazines. They said we can hit the O in God on a dime at 50 miles in the hands of a running man. And that, that, that is exactly what was used to punch that hole in that, uh, in that oil rig and start that whole Gulf War. And it, it, it poisoned our food supply. Fukushima is not poisoning our food supply on the West Coast. They're poisoning the ocean right now. Well, I, you know, the interesting thing, well, the thing is it doesn't really matter to me whether or not it was done on purpose or done by accident. I still think the British Petroleum should still end up being liquidated, which it hasn't been. You know, so it's uh, anyway. The long and short of it being, um, I think it is the case that w again, one of the reasons I think independent media is so important, and one of the reasons it's nice that it's so easy to make these days is that it allows people to share their own, basically their own experience, and to actually go out and gather information. And you know, we've seen some pretty extreme examples of that. You know, if it hadn't been for the photos taken at Abu Ghraib, we never would have known that there was a crazy person, you know, apparently nobody running the ship over there. And, but it was only the pictures that made people actually pay attention. And it was only the fact that the pictures were broadcast worldwide. You know, if, so the truth is that here inside the United States, when you have independent media makers actually creating content um, and creating, uh, capturing um, the story firsthand and distributing it worldwide, that's, I mean, I guess ultimately that is what makes us free, because the truth does usually stand up better than fiction. You know, it just, it now, getting, the, getting, the, getting the answer that you can prove is better than basically just taking the information that's handed to us over and over and over again by journalists who are on a 24-hour news schedule and don't really have, you know, they're not really allowed to leave their premises. That, that's kind of another thing that I read when I found out was really interesting. 
they were talking to CNN reporters, and they said, look, you know, we're in a 24-hour news cycle. We get four hours a day, maybe, to cover a story. And we're not going to leave, most cases, we're not going to leave the office. So we take the information that we get submitted to us. That's why so much of the coverage you're seeing is actually submitted by viewers. It's because the 24-hour news cycle and the economics of how much it costs to pay reporters means that they don't leave their chairs. So if you want any kind of real reporting, it's going to be the citizen journalist that does it and then ends up submitting it to the mainstream media. I've had, uh, there was a CIA, former CIA agent that was on uh, YouTube and I had his video up for a while. He, he was saying that, that basically us citizen journalists, I mean, and, and you know, I, I didn't buy a newspaper. I didn't buy an established magazine. I started writing it and started, promo and, and started mm -hmm. promoting it, put it up on the newsstands myself. So I became a publisher yes. and, and I wrote for it. My, mag my, my articles have been in you know, national publications and uh, for many years until I started my own magazines. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason uh, the the magazine did well before they tried to kill me was that I told the truth. I mean, I've been I've been writing and reporting for 25 years. I've never been sued for slander or libel. You know, I think that um, the other thing is that yeah, so on the film planning club, actually, I just put together. Um, a book at the last week or so. I had, uh, basically, I run a little event, and then um, I write up books to support the event. And so I have this little book. It costs like five bucks. But and also you can get a lot of the content on on the site free. But the the little book that's got five, it costs like five bucks has basically how to print a book, how to build um, a film production, um, how to fund a film production, how to market um, thing online. And the reason is because I figured that that Anybody who's got a really important story to tell will be able to find one of those solutions, and they'll be able to actually get their story out. So if you f if you know for a fact, because you live in a place where people have been doing fracking, and it and the water starts, you know, the, the, they do it, and then all of a sudden the water starts tasting really bad, and it starts killing your chickens, you know, I think that's a story I'd like to actually hear. So um, what I'm hoping is you'll pick up your camera, or you'll get your you'll get your book out, and you'll start taking those photos, and you'll start creating that story. Because I really don't think CNN or any of the news networks are going to go trotting out to your house to take a look at your chickens. You're the only one who's going to care about telling that story. And I think that's definitely true even now in the Gulf. They're not going to talk about And I think Fukushima is a good, another good example. I noticed that they're not crews over there. And yet Tokyo is talking about, you know, making plans to evacuate, uh, sorry, Japan's making plans to evacuate Tokyo. They're making, like they're making contingency plans. If the situation gets out of control at Fukushima, which, you know, it's, it's kind of going to go on for several hundred years, they're well, making plans to evacuate Tokyo. To where? Well, <laughs> I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that, because I may be able to tell you that. If, it, you know, nothing happens by, nothing in politics, according to some of our famous politicians, say, uh, nothing happens by accident. Well, I don't think Fukushima was an accident. And uh, they have built ghost cities in in China, mm -hmm. fully, fully potentially functional, but nobody in them. Were they yeah, prepared? I've, I've seen coverage of that, and Were actually I've read a couple of people that say that um, it is not only th well. The interesting thing is the Chinese won't move into them. Like not only it's not that they can't, they won't. Which is a very strange thing. Like why would you not want to move into a city that seems very modern? I don't know. That's like it's very troubling. That is one of the more troubling things on this planet, actually. <laughs> it's like because they are they are big cities, aren't they? When you look at the satellite pictures, they're pretty impressive. Yes, and they they, they are also <laughs> they are also doing it here. Did you know that? Um, I, I've read about FEMA camps before, which, you know, interesting, they talked about the FEMA camps, 